Europe is at war. It's not the first occasion in my lifetime. I'm old enough to remember the conflict as Yugoslavia disintegrated. But it feels... I'm not quite sure what the word is, but I think an element of it is the obvious futility. The idea that war is futile, or rather that it became futile at some point, appears in the work of Norman Angel. Angel is the pen name for a journalist, writer and peace campaigner who first rose to prominence shortly before the First World War. He was part of a generation of writers who were often seen as seminal in the development of international relations or foreign policy studies as distinct disciplines. My knowledge of both is quite limited. I did attend some lectures as a student, including some by Francis Fukuyama, who infamously authored The End of History. Though to be honest, I can't actually remember anything he said. I've read some of the classic works in foreign policy studies, for example Graham Allison's Essence of Decision, an important work on the Cuban Missile Crisis. But there's a limit to what I know. Disciplines like this always feel a bit curious from a historical point of view. They are almost exclusively concerned with past events, and in fact with precisely the type of past events, war, the relationship between states, that pre-modern historians were mostly concerned with. The divergence between history as a discipline and the newly developed fields like international relations is as much about historians changing their perspective. I've mentioned before how in the early 20th century the interest of historians expanded enormously to encompass all aspects of human activity, and that in the process political history, and especially military history, fell out of favour. Well, to some extent, other disciplines with a much stronger focus on the present stepped in to fill those gaps. If for example, you look at pre-modern historians like Abu Fazl or Thucydides, you will see they are mostly writing about the events of their own time. In fact, the first of those died before the end of the reign he was chronicling, and the work of the second stops before the war he set out to record had finished. In many ways, these are more like journalism than history. And yes, that kind of distinction would have seemed absurdly fine to such writers. A huge range of writing was, and to some extent still is, encompassed under the term history. But distinctions like this reflect the fragmentation of human knowledge that goes hand in hand with specialisation and the progress that specialisation makes possible. Anyway, I wanted to say a little bit about Norman Angel. Angel was not unknown before the First World War, but he rose to particular prominence with the publication of a work called the Great Illusion. Actually, it first appeared under a slightly different title, Europe's Optical Illusion, in 1909, but it is best known as The Great Illusion, reaching multiple editions and becoming well known in just a few years. I first encountered Angel's work while preparing an exhibition on the way we play with money, because Angel designed a game intended to explain the way credit functions to make communities richer. I'll get to that in a moment. The Great Illusion was an argument for peace, based not on the virtues of peace or on the horrors of war, but rather on the futility of conflict in the modern world, on what Angel refers to as little recognised facts. The argument is simple. Well, I say it's simple. The version I'm looking at runs to over 400 pages, but the argument is not particularly complex, and I suspect that before television, audiences just enjoyed more verbosity in presentation. On Victorian YouTube, this episode would probably run to over two hours. The illusion of the title is the assumption, as Angel puts it, that national power means national wealth national advantage, that expanding territory means increased opportunity for industry, that the strong nation can guarantee opportunities for its citizens that the weak nation cannot. But Angel argues that is not true, or at least it was no longer true by the 20th century. The world had simply become too interconnected. You cannot simply steal your neighbour's goods like some sort of primitive castle raid. 
because of this delicate interdependence of our credit-built finance. The confiscation by an invader of private property, whether stocks, shares, ships, mines, or anything more valuable than jewellery or furniture, anything in short, which is bound up with the economic life of the people, would so react upon the finance of the invader's country as to make the damage to the invader resulting from the confiscation exceed in value the property confiscated. And this idea that complex interconnected trade collapses in the face of war, that even the victors are poorer at the end of a conflict, was hugely influential in the 20th century. It's the foundational principle of the European Union. Of course, Angel's life and the reception of his work had highs and lows. Shortly after he achieved fame through the Great Illusion, Germany and Britain, the nations the book focuses on, did go to war in 1914. And Angel's reputation suffered in response. But with the end of that war, as it became apparent that everyone, victors and vanquished, were indeed poorer, and that there was, in fact, no way to extract reparations, the reputation of Angel's work flourished again. In 1934, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Technically, it was the 1933 prize, but it was deferred by a year, primarily for his argument in The Great Illusion. The game that first got me to look at Angel was also published in the 1930s. I said that it was designed to teach the mutual advantage of systems of credit, and you should be able to see the point, teach people how interconnected their world is, how fragile that interconnectedness is, and they won't want to fight. Well, that bit of Angel's argument has never entirely worked. There are people fighting in Ukraine today, despite the fact that everyone knows that we will all be poorer for it, whatever the outcome. And it is the part that was often misunderstood at the time, as the Nobel Committee remarked in awarding the prize. Because Angel had proved war to be foolish, to be a bad business proposition. Many believed that he had said there would be no more war in Europe. And here I think we begin to tease out some of the differences between past focused disciplines like historical research today and present focused disciplines like international relations. Why did Angel write the way he did? Why was it open to confusion? Because, at the beginning of the 20th century, most people did not think war was futile. Risky, certainly, but they expected the victors to profit by it. We should, perhaps, take some crumb of comfort that very few people operate under that illusion in the 21st century. And those are historical questions. Questions about the past. Why? Why does knowing this not stop wars? The success of the European Union as a peace project suggests binding people in trade can stop war, but events in Ukraine suggest people will fight, even against their own best interests. These are very much questions for the study of international relations. And they are, I think, complementary and vital questions we probably ought to be asking at moments like this.